Sorry to keep you waiting, everyone. It's been too long, Jonathan Frostathan fans. Whether or not you think this game is underrated, I personally don't, everyone else calls this game a cult classic, as they should. A full decade has passed since the objectively best 3DS game was released with nothing new on the franchise. This is how F-Zero fans feel. And given how being a pit main in Smash Brothers seems to be the one thing that good old society is willing to remember me for, it's kind of surprising that I haven't made a video on this game yet. Luckily for you, I can easily talk about the game's soundtrack. Kid Icarus Uprising might be my favorite soundtrack in a Nintendo game. I would honestly argue that this is the Cowboy Bebop of video game OSTs. Not just in terms of being really f***ing amazing, but in terms of being insanely diverse, incorporating more genres and clever techniques than one work of fiction could reasonably handle. Not to mention that none of it is plagiarized contrary to what some people on the internet randomly feel like thinking. Clearly! You don't have any knowledge on how music works. The fact that I'm even comparing Kid Icarus Uprising to my all-time favorite work of fiction should speak volumes as to how good this soundtrack is. This game includes some fantastic film score techniques, interesting instrumentation, supremely sublime scales, and lightly luscious leitmotifs that turn Motoi Sakuraba, Yuzu Koshiro, Masafumi Takada, Noriyuki Iwadare, Takahiro Nishi, and Yasuhiro Mitsuda into the titans that they've always been titled as in creating the best Nintendo soundtrack ever. Remember that best is YouTuber speak for personal favorites, but for some reason nobody wants to admit that yet. <laughs> One of the game's more overlooked aspects about the flight sections are how they're soundtracked. Any noobs younger than the 3DS, which I know for a fact won't be commenting at this time, as the YouTube age limit is 13, and I surpassed that number by 10 years, probably haven't noticed this in the films or shows that they watch, but every once in a while, the background music will be timed with the scene. It can be something as simple as just cutting to new shots after a set amount of measures, or having the music's length match the scene. Both of these are somewhat common techniques that even I've used in at least two of my videos that for some reason you haven't been watching, have you? But one of the most famous examples of the former technique is JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. The reason why we love it when they do the ora ora thing is because the JoJo theme starts playing when they have the enemy right where they want them. And when the good part comes in, they lay down some of the most foregrounded sounds you will ever hear. Though you can usually tell when their theme is split apart for a scene sake. That's just a consequence of repeating a single song for multiple scenes. Though formerly, scrutinizing the ground was the best place to find information. Sometimes you'll even find fruits that everyone can eat. But in the modern times that I would expect people to be in, you would have to climb a ladder to find the best examples of these techniques. Sometimes a film's song will carry the scene. In this situation, I would like to introduce you Zoomers to a film called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Not only is it one of the best spaghetti westerns and overall one of the most iconic films in general, but its soundtrack is considered to be one of, if not the best, film scores in the entire medium of film. It has that iconic whistle trill, followed by the whole that plays whenever shit's about to go down. It is the Wild West after all, but a stronger example would be my favorite track in the movie, The Ecstasy of Gold. It's a masterpiece in music composition by itself. Remember what kind of college student you're listening to. But when you listen to it in context of the movie, it elevates the scene to a whole new level. As Tuco's ecstasy for gold rises, the score's dynamics increase, and so does Tuco's running. Just like how I'm running into the fact that this is the second time on my channel that I went from talking about JoJo's to immediately talking about films starring Clint Eastwood, which isn't a lot. 
but it's weird that it happened twice. In Kid Igarus Uprising, it takes these film score techniques and just keeps on doing it. Sometimes it does hinder a casual listening experience, but it more than makes up for it by how it carries the flight sections in gameplay. You can notice this almost right away with the first two chapters having the music stop and start again for certain story beats. When this happens, the score is less like the good, the bad, and the ugly score, and more like a kid's cartoon score, where instruments are usually timed to highlight comedic or intense actions. I mean, it does have the whole kid's cartoon vibe at times, but hey. It still fits in the context of the game. This technique doesn't have a specific name, but two techniques that the flight sections use are underscoring and musical cues. Underscoring is when the music accompanies the action, like when you hear a desert theme being played before Palutena parts the water by borrowing Poseidon's powers, to which a pirate-like theme will start playing. Musical cues are when the music is directing the action, like when there's G-Force in pits. <laughs> Ow, ow, why did that hurt my eyes? <laughs> Jeez. One notable example is while flying through Pandora's Labyrinth. It starts off as orchestral music as you go through the space pocket, but once you enter the labyrinth, it starts playing atmospheric music, but it eventually transitions into a trip-hop musical theme. The music even stops once you see the first fake entrance and cues between orchestra and atmospheric music in the varying sections of the labyrinth. There are also less complex examples, such as in Chapter 8, when it cues the galactic sea and the dramatic appearance of the space pirate ship. But the most important musical cue is Pit soaring through the sky while singing a victory jingle before being interrupted by the lunar sanctum. The combinations of varying sections follow a term that is specifically defined, and that is called through composed music, which is music that doesn't have any repeating sections or really any sections for that matter. This is not a common occurrence in video games because video game music usually loops. Even Kid Icarus Uprising has looping music when you're on the ground, but when you're in the air, the music does not loop, barring a few occasional exceptions, such as when you need to shoot down the reset bomb. But aside from that, Arxis fighting games are the only other games I know of that have music that doesn't loop. But not only are those songs not through composed music, but Kid Icarus Uprising's non-loop tracks are actually intentional. Seriously, you have no idea how much it bothers me when I'm just playing like Blades Blue or Guilty Gear, and then the music just suddenly stops. Like seriously, Arxis, normalize looping your f***ing music during gameplay. It's okay. Sheesh. I'm getting a little too sidetracked here because as we all know, Pit can only fly for five minutes straight, which coincidentally is the maximum length of these flight sections. Because if we surpass that limit, his wings burn out. But I'm sure that I can at least talk about the genres during that time. The music genre of the transition that you just heard is orchestral rock. Not to be confused with symphonic rock, which is rock music featuring symphonic instruments. Orchestral rock is orchestra music featuring rock. The orchestra sets the tone of the game and the rock sets the tone of everything around the game. To put it in the words of somebody who is clearly not subscribed to my channel, that opening theme played in orchestra tells you what kind of game you're playing. Kid Icarus Uprising is a grand beginning of a grand return to the grand adventure of this sweet child of Icarus and Palutena. The orchestra also gives nostalgia to that first town. Such a grand way to begin an adventure, wouldn't you say? And then once you fight Twin Bellows, you start hearing that first boss theme played in orchestral rock. The melody likes to step up while the bass steps down. You'd think that the fast tempo would be enough to create a hype song, which it is, but it's actually the chord progression becoming clearer that pumps up the player just as much as it pumps up Pit himself. The chorus just screams how Pit will rain death upon you. I mean, listen and tell me if you agree. Although, of course, orchestral rock isn't the only genre that this game has to offer. 
I also mentioned how the game includes trip-hop music when you enter Pandora's Labyrinth, but other genres of music include acid jazz on the Aram Island to demonstrate the bizarre nature of the Aram and how all parties call a truce and investigate it, heavy metal when first meeting Phosphora to match her electrified personality, and even spaghetti western during Dark Pit's theme. Oh hey, that's the same genre as in the good, the bad, and the ugly. Makes sense to reference this because Dark Pit is a servant to no one but himself. Plus you have Palutena the good, Medusa the bad, and Dark Pit the... I could never call him ugly. But I can't call him beautiful either. But given how he is the third party of this Wild West, I can call Dark Pit a wild card. I mean, Dark Pit's level is the only one where there's no orchestra music at any point, which is pretty wild in itself. Video games usually stick to one music genre to maintain an identity, but the reason why Kid Icarus Uprising's novelty of a variety of genres works is because the game goes to a myriad of locations. You start off with orchestra in that first town, but the next thing you know you're going into caves, temples, palaces, pirate ships, volcanoes, moons, alien islands, whatever this is supposed to be, whatever this is supposed to be, and it still maintains its identity because even with all of these genres, orchestra is still the most prominent one. One. Much like how Cowboy Bebop still has Bebop Jazz as the main genre despite also experimenting with other genres as well. Makes you wonder what the actual instruments mean, doesn't it? Obviously, this soundtrack uses a lot of brass. This brass is meant to represent Pitt's heroism and even his lion heart. Whether he will battle beasts or fly high in the sky with no diamonds because Pitt shines bright enough as is, the brass highlights Pitt's determination. Some of the more common brass instruments used for Pitt are higher pitched instruments such as trumpets, often accompanied by flutes and or violins. Even in songs that don't completely involve Pitt, the trumpets still reference him and his behaviors, such as during the Wrath of the Reset Bomb where the trumpets are used to demonstrate Pitt's determination having learned how to take out the Reset Bomb. If the trumpets aren't doing it, then the string instruments are serving that purpose instead. <laughs> It's also seen in the Aram Island to symbolize Pitt's curiosity about the Aram. The other characters are curious about it too, but the trumpets take place when the focus is on Pitt. Brass instruments are used for other characters as well, such as Magnus. Unlike Pitt, Magnus is more serious and reserved, so the brass instruments used for him are more akin to lower pitched horns. But as we previously established, not everyone uses brass instruments to represent them. Dark Pit's acoustic guitars not only speak to his differences from Pit, but to every other character in the game. Bitu Eastwood claims to be a servant to no one but himself, so to hear such a distinct instrument like an acoustic guitar being exclusive to Dark Pit's theme makes sense. However, he does start to show a bit of a purple face as he starts to lean towards the same good side of Pit. And before fighting Medusa, Dark Pit gets a more heroic arrangement of his leitmotif with acoustic guitars. But we'll lightly touch upon motifs later. If instruments can reference characters, what about story beats? In terms of underscoring, the instruments will change to fit the scenes that Pitt's flying through. During the Wish Seed chapter, while it does play the standard orchestra plus violins at first, you start to hear a sitar playing as Pitt explores the volcano. It might not be enough to steam the sacred buns, but it's used to fill the scene with molten lava, so that works too. It's also seen within the Wrath of the Reset Bomb. Thankfully, Wrath is one of the deadly sins that Pitt is able to handle even if he's afraid, but this one is more of a dynamic dynamics decreasing and increasing as opposed to direct changes or prioritizations within the instruments. Fast forward three years and we hear this same theme, but in a different context. It first hypes the reveal of Viridi with those trumpets, which would shock the player to see Viridi controlling Pitt's flight path. 
But then the violins come in to assure Pit that Viridi is here to help, not to hurt. Then we hear the violins spinning around like the tornadoes that Pit passes until we find Palutena bathed in an evil green light with an accompanying soprano soloist who sings a gorgeously ominous tune that highlights her corrupted soul. And after Pit finds the lightning chariot, we get to my favorite track in the game, Destroyed Sky World. This track still has brass, it still has strings, it still has the other orchestra instruments, but this time they're played in a Locrian scale as opposed to a basic Ionian or Aeolian scale. Locrian scales aren't used too much in any soundtrack, let alone video game soundtracks. Now normally, this would be the part where I needlessly stab every other soundtrack in existence for not being exactly like Kid Icarus Uprising soundtrack, despite not having listened to every song in existence, but for once, I'm not doing that. Reasonably, almost no one uses Locrian scales because they're unstable and disorienting by design. Locrian scales have a minor second and a tritone in the chord. But look at Skyworld in its current state. It's being run by a corrupted Palutena. The Centurions have been forced to attack the human towns. There is destruction among the world in general. The temples of Skyworld are destroyed. I mean, anyone with a memory span of the average movie reviewer could figure that out. But Skyworld isn't just destroyed physically, but spiritually as well. And seeing all of these ruins is uncomfortable. Comfortable. The instruments playing in the Locrian scale are emphasizing how far Skyworld has fallen in only three years. The strings are used to highlight Pitt's reaction to seeing his home in such disorder, and the brass is used to highlight how Pitt was responsible for this destruction. Indirectly, to be fair, but that doesn't make it less horrifying. Not even a jack of all trades could handle this chaos. Notice how the brass instruments are playing the same theme that the soprano soloist previously sang. So much for heroism, am I right? And I'm just gonna say this, Destroyed Skyworld is my favorite video game level theme Period. Not my favorite video game song, nor is it my favorite Nintendo track, and it's not my favorite video game level in general. But when comparing it to the other themes of video game levels, Destroyed Skyworld has got to be my favorite level theme. The feelings it conveyed are delivered to essential perfection. It makes you wonder who's responsible for these feelings. What kind of person would let this sort of thing happen? <laughs> it's not me. But I'm taking over anyway. Hey, AC here. John Rob asked me to join him on this video, so here I am. While this gargantuan OST spans over 70 tracks and includes dozens of musical genres, there's a lot of material that actually connects a lot of the tunes, and that material is often referred to as leitmotif. Leitmotif is a term used to describe musical recurring themes that are associated with a particular character, story beat, idea, or narrative theme. Kid Icarus Uprising makes beautiful use of leitmotif, whether they are spun from the classic themes of the original NES game or written exclusively for this title and its sprawling narrative. The first theme I like to delve into is the classic underworld theme, first heard in the original Kid Icarus. Take a listen to this melody. This theme is perhaps the most iconic from the original NES title. Escaping the hellish underworld was quite the feat. This is even lampooned in Kid Icarus Uprising, when Palutena jokes that the underworld was where Pit died the most. It goes to say that players really got to hear the underworld theme a lot. This theme is heard so much within the first few chapters of the game, and even beyond. The classic underworld theme in Kid Icarus Uprising is used to represent Pit and Palutena, as well as their mission to protect the human race. When underworld monsters invade the earth and terrorize the humans, Pit triumphantly returns to battle for the first time in 25 years. This theme is the most prevalent of all the leitmotifs. We hear it in the intro, we hear it in the first stage, we hear it transformed in the Reaper Palace theme, and we even hear it at the end of the game. Typically, the use of this theme represents heroism and doing the right thing. However, there are some interesting and unexpected places where we hear this theme. There's a special boss battle theme that plays during the Medusa fight in Chapter 9, where this theme is woven throughout the dramatic moments of 
of the song. It makes sense when you think about Medusa and Palutena's connection, which is never explained in much depth in canon. However, a lot of connection is heavily implied between Did the two you characters. Just call me Later on, Pit is forced to fight Palutena, and surprisingly enough, the same boss theme plays that you heard while fighting Medusa. I really feel like you can infer a lot from this. The use of the darker version of the Underworld leitmotif, first heard associated with Medusa speaks volumes, while leaving a lot to the imagination of the player. The best narratives are those that leave the player with more speculation, and I think it's amazing that a lot can be inferred largely through the music. After all, music speaks where the dialogue does not. Pit and Palutena have a second theme in this game as well, a theme that's heard during the in-game menus, the first ground theme, and at the very end of the game when Pit triumphs over the main villain. This theme is beautiful, majestic, and has this beautiful, beautiful air of antiquity behind it. More on that later, but first, let's take a look at another leitmotif, the theme of the Chaos Kin, and of all the suffering and sorrow that monster brought to the characters. The Chaos Kin is a parasitic, twisted, horrific being with the ability to control its host victims. It slowly feeds off of their souls while driving them mad. One arc of the game involves this being latching onto Palutena with unspeakable consequences. Pitt wakes up after three years of unconsciousness to find that Palutena has gone on a murderous rampage, slaughtering the humans she once sought to protect. The Chaos Kin leitmotif is first heard to convey Pitt's grief, despair, and utter shock at the events that had transpired. He he laments the loss of Palutena as he explores his once beautiful home, Skyworld, which has been reduced to rubble, as Pitt grapples with the pain of knowing that he might have to end Palutena's life, as she may be far too gone to be saved. Thankfully, he manages to save her, but then we hear the theme again as he gives chase to the Chaos Kin, who runs off with Palutena's soul in the most horrible, twisted dimension that one could possibly conceive of. This iteration of the leitmotif is the most twisted and frenetic. Palutena's life is on the line as Pitt races to save her soul. The dialogue, as well as the phenomenal voice acting in all of these scenes is plenty to convey Pitt's despair, agony, grief, shock, franticness, but the heart-wrenching theme really brings it on home. It would be nothing short of an absolute travesty for me to discuss leitmotifs that are tied to characters and narrative themes without discussing the theme associated with one of the most callous, vile, cold-hearted, yet completely hammy villains of all time. I'm talking, of course, about Hades. His theme is frightening, sitting in the rather dark key of F minor. Let's take a listen. We first hear this theme when Hades literally tears the credit screen in half, making his grand entrance and revealing himself as a twisted mastermind behind the events of the first third of the game. This iteration of the theme feels like fire, brimstone, and utter fear, and it fits Hades so well. Underneath his smarmy nature, he is truly twisted and morally devoid. Sometimes his charm can belie his true nature, but this theme full of gravitas reminds players of who he really is. While he may be funny, and definitely the best Nintendo a villain of all time, let's be real, he's evil. At one point, Pitt sets off to fight Hades one last time, except that fight ends in the blink of an eye, and Pitt finds himself in a strange place, except it isn't anywhere on Earth, or the heavens, or hell. Pitt finds himself in the belly of the beast. Hades' theme is restated as Pitt wanders around his insides, but in a very plodding and ominous sense. That theme is then woven into one of the most compositionally bold pieces of Kid Icarus Uprising. Bassoons and clarinets are heard echoing short, repeated, crescendoing notes, while the lowest winds march along. The harp and mallets then play this twistedly gleeful melody, and then the rest of the orchestra, with brass at the forefront, join in with this off-balance, almost drunken, staggering line that just screams, get me out of here! It perfectly underscores Pitt as he descends into madness, fighting hordes of monsters as he searches for a way out of Hades, of course before he meets a horrendous and disgusting <laughs> fate. This theme is constantly echoed throughout the 
final battle, the long, epic struggle between Pit and Hades. This iteration of the theme just shows how colossal of a presence he is, literally and as a god who has become too powerful for his own good. The theme echoes desperation and struggle as Pit clings to life and gives the fight everything he's got. It makes for such an epic final fight, making it all the more satisfying when Pit delivers the final blow. Hades has been such an overbearing presence, causing so many humans to die, stealing their souls for his own benefit, and causing so much grief throughout the game. Hearing his theme restated throughout the final fight in so many ways drives the point here, and it makes it all the more satisfying when Pit triumphs over him. And of course, to wrap up our narrative with one big musical bow, we hear two themes. The first theme we hear is the original Kid Icarus theme, and then the second theme we hear is that sweeping main theme of the game. For a soundtrack that is as expansive as the Kid Icarus Uprising soundtrack, having running themes or leitmotifs really serves to create a sense of cohesiveness and theme, both musically and relating to the storyline. Musically speaking, the human brain thrives on repetition. A leitmotif is a repeated theme, but it can be imagined in different ways. The composers of this game never fail to restate these cornerstone themes of the game in ways that help support the narrative and convey the emotional impact of these scenes. There's a reason why I always cite this game's soundtrack as my favorite. And now, back to John Robb. <laughs> So, yeah, Kid Icarus Uprising just might have my favorite Nintendo music of all time, and it's possibly my favorite video game soundtrack ever. It's not magnum opus material or anything, nor would I call it my favorite soundtrack in all of media, but I've yet to see a Nintendo soundtrack top this game's, except for the closest being the Xenoblade series, but I'll let you know when I end up talking about Xenoblade music. Cool? Cool, cool, cool. But keep in mind that I don't love Kid Icarus Uprising soundtrack just for its variety. I do believe in the age-old quote, quality over quantity, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to celebrate games that excel in both. That's kind of what I prefer in general. It's why I'm a fanboy of the Tales series. It's why Cowboy Bebop is my favorite work of fiction. It's why I've continued pursuing three majors instead of just one or two at a university that's not so high quality, especially not after hearing some recent things. But I would be long gone if it weren't for a good chunk of the people that I've met on that campus. Even though I still don't think that Kid Icarus Uprising is as underrated as some people say it is, I do think its soundtrack deserves more praise. You know who else deserves more praise? 